Welcome. My name is Laura Ferguson, and I'm the Senior Curator of Western History at the High Desert Museum. Thanks for joining us this evening. We're glad you're here. I'm so pleased tonight to be joined by Gwendolyn Trice. Gwen is the founder and executive director of the Maxville Heritage Interpretive Center, a museum located in Joseph, Oregon. Maxville Heritage Interpretive Center was inspired by an Oregon public broadcasting documentary titled The Logger's Daughter, which shed light on this little known history of African-American loggers and their families who migrated to Maxville from all over the South and Midwest. The recruitment of African-American loggers was unique to Oregon. Exclusion laws that prohibited free blacks and mulattoes from living and working were in effect when Maxville was erected. Its mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the rich history of the multicultural railroad logging community of Maxville, Oregon, and similar communities in the Pacific Northwest. Gwen, who's a videographer, contribute key oral history interviews, photographs, and transcripts for the OPB documentary. She also has contributed greatly to our knowledge of the individuals who lived and worked at Maxville through articles in the Oregon Encyclopedia, blackpast.org, and the Oregon Historical Quarterly. She contributed to a musical play called On to Higher Ground with the award-winning musician and playwright, Mark Ross. Gwen served as the Oregon State Advocacy Commission of Black Affairs and serves today on the State Advisory on Historic Preservation. She's received awards from the Oregon Women of Achievement and the Museum of Natural and Cultural History at the University of Oregon for her work. Gwen's work is relevant now and for the long view. I'm so pleased that she's joining us this evening. To start things off, we'd like to share with you a video which will introduce you to Maxville and a few of the people who lived and worked there. The video is titled Maxville Voices, Remember Their Names. It's about 10 minutes in length and after that, Gwen will begin her talk. If you have any questions for Gwen, please feel free to place them in the comments section in YouTube and I'll ask Gwen a few of those at the end of her, her um, comments this evening. So with that, let's go to the video. My name is Bob Baggett, Hosea Lowry, Lafayette Lucky Trice, Odell Sassanet, Julius, Julius Coleman, Coleman, Esther Wilfong, Joe Paul Pat Patterson, Old Doc Gregory, Vivian Anderson, Saritha May, Ruby Sassanak, Ellen Torrance, Ellen Torrance, Maddie Langsford, Ella Trice, Ann Hawthorne. I am not a ghost or an apparition. I'm a story. I'm a town called Maxville. <laughs> Maxville? Oh my, you looking for pleasure, you gotta go someplace else. They work you six out of seven, from can't see to can't see. Leave in the pitch dark, get home in the pitch dark. Hard, hard work, falling trees with a two-man cross cut. We used to call them misery whips. I was partnered with Odell my first day. <laughs> Man, he rode me without mercy used to call me green stuff. Say, hey, green stuff, you gotta stop riding that saw. You keep pushing, but you gotta learn to just pull. This here misery whip lives up to its name every time you push it, son. He say, at the end of your pull, you gotta ease up. I will feel your easing up, and then I pull. You pull. I pull. You pull. I pull. You pull. Pull, no pushing. He say if we're bucking right, it'll feel like we're cutting butter in July. If you push it, you'll warp it or worse. Then he stuck a finger in my chest and said, the first time today you push that whip, I'm throwing a handful of pebbles at you around a tree. 
Second time you push it, I'm chucking a tater-sized rock at you. You push that saw a third time today, green stuff, and I'm personally coming around the tree at you with a rock bigger than your old empty head. I sure do miss Odell. Yes, Bowman Hicks put whites on one side of rail tracks and coloreds on the other. For the most part, we got along, sometimes real good. Other times, well, if somebody's gonna get the dirty end of the stick, we all knew who it was. What they thought was a little scratch, felt more like a deep cut. What they thought was a funny joke, wasn't. Deep down, I know the names they called some of us they just thought was normal. But what do you do with that? I mean, what do you call that feeling when a white friend that you really like, you hear them call your uncle or your cousin midnight or nigger Bob or boy? What do you do with how that feels? Up until Bowman Hicks left, our children wasn't allowed to go to school with theirs or go into their houses, but they played together. And all of the crew bosses and the soups, the supervisors, they were all white, as were the nice homes. Our men folk played baseball separate at Maxville. Two teams against each other. Uh, coloreds versus whites, and we whooped their tails real good. Them and any other team that played us well, <laughs> until they wouldn't play us anymore. It wasn't until recently I heard that Maxville was the only segregated town here in Oregon. Well, none of us were gonna complain. I mean, we all needed the work. Not to mention most of us was from the South anyway, where Segregation was as common as breathing, and it wasn't going to do no good to complain in a company town. I mean, I never thought to complain. When you're standing out in the pouring rain all your life, it never occurs to you to complain about getting wet. Lots of us came out here from Arkansas and Georgia, Alabama, Florida, and the Midwest, all thinking that Oregon would be a better place to work. But the Klan was here too, and in the 20s pretty much ran the whole state. A little company town remote as Maxville, you'd guess was not going to be a target. But we saw crosses being burned in the hills of Maxville and Wallowa. One night the Klan came out, dressed in their hoods and sheets and drove right into camp. We all wondered, how will our whites here react? Is there hate flowing in the man that you were logging with this morning? Will he turn his head and look the other way tonight? Will he pull his curtains, lose his hearing? Lynching was a national pastime back then. They stopped on the road in and got out. And then out came our super the white boss of the camp. He came right at him, held up his hand and stopped him. He told those boys he knew who they were under them hoods, knew their names, their families, where they lived and worked. He told them to turn around and get out and they weren't welcome in Maxville. Get the hell out and stay out. And damned if they didn't turn around and leave. It was a brave thing to do. He could have just stepped aside. He could have done a number of bad things, but he didn't. It was that night that opened up a lot of eyes and tempered a lot of hearts, including mine.
Maxville was just thin pickings. Even the houses weren't proper houses, just shy of being shacks, really, built to fit on flatbed cars right on the tracks so they could move them to where the logging was. One door, one window, one room, with a stovepipe hole out the side. No plumbing, no electricity. The only thing that we had lots of was bed bugs. Lots and lots of bed bugs. And not just in your bed, neither. I found one once at the bottom of my mush bowl, looking up at me. <laughs> I was sure that I had just swallowed the rest of his family. Made me scream so, I scared the husband almost to death. <laughs> Isn't it a gift from God, how we mostly lose the bad and store up the good, like us women in childbirth? How we somehow forget all the pain of our first, or else we'd never ever have our second. Bowman and Hicks did everything they could to keep us apart. Except for the men working together, did everything they could to have us hauling water from different spigots or playing baseball on separate teams. The thing is, when you got folks struggling all together, folks start caring and listening, and stories get shared. Stories of friends back home, or nieces getting married, or holidays and such. Nope, the company really failed at keeping Maxville apart. The men, black and white, worked elbow to elbow all day long. And all us women crossed the tracks at some time. We'd borrow a cup of sugar, take some soup, whoever got sick, share some gossip over washing clothes. <laughs> when you're in it like we were, no matter what it is, you find that things go easier when you're getting along. Life starts when stories get shared. And you know, it usually ends up that way too. Thank you so much for coming and spending some time with us in this space this evening. Uh, my, again, my name is Gwen Trice and I'm the director and the founder of the Maxville Heritage Interpretive Center. I'm so um, just proud of this piece with the voices of the people of Maxville. And just so that you all know, that these, we have transcripts early on in our work that we recorded the audio and video of these voices. And then we married those voices to local, local actors in the Portland area. And um, it was directed by Marv Ross, one of our longtime friends and supporters of the arts and um, collective works. And so it's really important that we allow you to hear those voices. For me today, I look back on my experience and I'm not sure how much things have changed since then, but let's take a journey together and let's just reiterate a little bit. I'm going to share my screen right now and I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, some of the elements. Um, I can't assume that everyone that's tuned in tonight knows about our collective history so bear with me for those folks that know more about that history. Um, it's so important to tell it um, multiple times and to 
really share that history with others. So we, this is where our museum is located in Eastern Oregon. This is Wallowa County. And I wanted to talk about the, US, the United States Constitution of the 15th Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section two, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. And when Oregon joined the states, their constitution, and they joined the, um, the states, the United States with this constitution in place that no free Negro or mulatto or not residing in the state at the time of the adoption of this constitution shall come reside or be within the state or hold any real estate or make any contracts or maintain any suit therein. And the legislative assembly shall provide by penal laws for the removal by public officers of all such Negroes and mulattoes and for their effectual exclusion from the state and for the punishment of persons who shall bring them into the state or employ or harbor them. And this is part of Oregon's history. And I'm giving you just some images of, I'm gonna go back to the KKK in Lane County. The, the Klan was very viable across Oregon, including where I was born and raised. Governor Pierce was um, funded by our the Klan as well as he also he came out of La Grande where I was born and raised in the 60s and 70s. So I'm going to talk with you a little bit later about gee, what was my experience that might have been different than those voices that you just heard? So just to reiterate some of the rare lumber industry that people, African-American people were recruited, sorry, for, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, um, that, that African-American people loggers, experienced loggers were recruited from the South and the Midwest. And they were brought, they were recruited to the town of Maxville. Um, there were Greek loggers and there was a, a local Greek logging camp and they were part of that workforce. And it was illegal for free blacks, of, of course, uh, that we just spoke of. And the, they were seasoned lumberjacks. That's why they were brought in, as they knew how to move millions of board feet in a small amount of time based on their history and the work they've done across the United States. And then the, build, the bridge builders were part of the Greek community. And they, I mean, a lot of them, if you look at the history a lot of these loggers and bridge builders knew how to do multiple jobs within these communities. And so they were valued very deeply. And the in industry was bringing big revenue into Oregon communities. And Wallowa County, they absolutely, um, they prospered as a result of that. So keep in mind between 1923 and 1933, that was when the company town of Bowman Hicks purchased the site and created the Maxville town site. So it was segregated, black and white separate. They had two baseball teams, a black and a white team, segregated schools. And then I wanted to say that changes do happen very slowly. The schools actually came into one school and I was able to interview the woman that taught those kids and she shared with them very deeply that that no one is better than the other in that space and then after the demise of the Maxwell town site when the banks um, began to close that company that southern and midwest 
Holdings Company took all their holdings. They took the metal of the rails and pulled those up and they moved out of our community. I want to speak about Vernonia a bit that they had also a segregated logging community in Oregon. And there's many others that we're just uncovering and that's so important to tell the American narrative with the inclusion of all of us. So in Vernonia, they had a Philippine, Japanese and black quarter that were separate from the, the, the dominant culture, which was the white um, quarter that were, were bigger. So although the KKK was marketed as a family um, organization, so it really was the biggest sort of club community club uh, um, for kids and women and men alike, it created energy around the conditions of Vernonia until the NAACP stepped in um, after the advocate um, came in and interviewed people there and made it public. So, so conditions changed. We had sundown towns in Oregon and we still have those laws on the books. So James W. Lowen created the book called Sundown Towns. It's a great opportunity through the book and through his website um, to, to discover Oregon sundown towns that still have those laws on the books right today. And it gives you detailed ways of getting those laws off of the books and going to next steps for healing communities. So there were many people that were set aside um, in those towns. And, you know, they had signs out that were not pleasant that said, inward, don't let the sun go down on you in this particular town. And it wasn't just for African-American people. And I wanted to share this other book with you, Ruth and the Green Book. I. If you'll look on our Maxville Heritage um, um, Facebook page, um, it's called Maxville Heritage Interpretive Center and it's our Facebook page. I do a reading of Ruth and the Green Book and I love this book and I won't, don't wanna go into great detail about it because we only have an hour to connect to make those, those comments and, and reflections, but this is an, an amazing book that talks about how African-American people had to travel for their safety across the United States. So think of the Green Book as being the AAA guide for African-American people to go to places to eat, to sleep, to have gas stations that will serve us, us as well as um, medication and, and all kinds of things that you that a lot of people take for granted, but it, that weren't um, accessible to other groups. This is a company photo of some of the African American loggers. My dad was on the top row of that. And I'll just kind of um, just give a pause there and hopefully this won't move forward is to just really talk a little bit about my growing up. So we're talking about 1923 and the people that came to Oregon and, and their experiences in these spaces. And I grew up in the 70, 60s and 70s in La Grande. And I had many experiences that for me, made me feel that I wasn't equal and that they, they were predisposed. They were systemically built to keep people of color in certain tracks for um, employment, for education, for reaching out and building um, a space for their families. So as a young child, I was always told that you're only going to be a nurse or a janitor, or you're going to be in these spaces. And seeing my family 
in the work they did, my aunts, my grandmother, even my father, even though he had other private businesses and he was an, um, a logger, he drove a logging truck after Maxville and he did many things. We needed to supplement those funds to support the family. And of course, we're rural Oregon and I am a rural girl um, over and over, even though I spent 30 years in Seattle and I worked at Boeing for a long time, it was my opportunity to learn more about the world around me and communities. And so when I came back, I was able to really see it with a different lens of that there's this contribution, this contribution that's been made by not only my family, but other families that we are all immigrant to. And, and we've, the history doesn't reflect that in the work that we do. And so it was a, um, a privilege to be able to come back home and really embrace my family history, embrace the places that we've um, occupied and remember that as a child, many kids would say, you're an inward and you can't come in my house. My mom and dad said that this is who you are and you can't play with us. So others would say, well, you can play out in the yard with our children, but you can't come in our homes. And it would be that same story for years growing up. And so it was very clear that there was a, a great divide in how um, the history didn't re reflect the contribution of the people and our work. And it was important for me to walk away from our, my environment and come back renewed with this knowledge and just this personal connection to who I am as a person on the planet, but at that my family was recruited in an industry that was very big in Oregon during that time. And they made their work be la lifelong and lasting. My father was a conservationist and he worked with elders and the youth in our community and helped in many ways. And he taught the children, his children to do the same. And so to take that legacy of what he left us and to come back home and to create other components that can inform not only our local communities, but to celebrate the work that we do at Maxwell Heritage Interpretive Center, but the healing that comes from being able to talk to multiple generations about how we're impacted in positive ways by the relationships that happened with all of us immigrants. And I, I say that, I don't, I, I need to, to correct that because our mission and vision encompass the first peoples that were here before for us and we honor and acknowledge um, the all of the native people from the Nez Perce and Nimipu people, the Cayuse, the Walla Walla um, tribes, and um, and if I forget one, forgive, forgive for that. But I we can't do our work without the acknowledgement of those people that came before us. But then looking at the acknowledgement of what we do today isn't set yet. And so one of the pieces of work we do is really um, complementary of that. And so I'd like to share some of that with you. I have so much that, that to share in this small period of time. So just bear with me as I go through some of that. So here's the operations at Maxville and some of the, the men that helped to run it and to build that um, schematic for bringing in multiple groups of people to do the work around Maxville. And this, this is an example of one of the white homes 
at the Maxville town site back in the day. Here were the black homes. If you'll look to the, the, it's the right side of my screen, there's a taller building that's separate from those log, those um, um, railroad cars. And that building is the black school. And that's, and in the front of the front left, you can see that they raised pigs um, to supplement um, the foods that they had there. And Ray Pocket is a gentleman that passed away and reached out to me and his family was brought here from Arkansas. They lived in the town of Wallowa until their house was built and took and it was brought up via rail to Maxville and they lived up there. And, and if you'll see the young boy in front with the gun, that's Ray Puckett. When he called me, he was, I believe, in his late 80s to 90s and living in California and helped us to supplement a lot of the work that we, that uh, through photographs that he shared with us. This is a picture of some of the students in the Maxville school and the teacher that they had at that time. And then and just looking, sorry, at the type of logging they did was everything was very much based on horses, on steam donkeys, on manpower. And if you'll look at the manpower, it's 6,000 to 8,000 calories a day they had to eat in order to do the jobs that they did in that space. And then they would deck those logs up in the winter time and the easiest time to move them, those logs, without destroying the landscape is by hauling them um, in the snow and on frozen grounds. And I love, this is one of my favorite images of some of the women and the children that lived at Maxville. And it, this is, doesn't talk about every group, but it really tells a picture. It tells the story that when you're separated from bigger communities, that it really is dependent upon all of us to come together to for our children, for the foods, for um, when, when the men are gone and they may be gone for days, that we can connect to bring foods to each other, um, crafts to bring re religion and connection. And so it's a, it was a powerful part of the story as well as the baseball. And this is part of that Maxville baseball team that we we just love to talk about. And as one of our new programs we're working on is to build a uh, Maxville team that's an exhibition team that plays local um, teams within the community like they did back in the day. They play, the tribes had a team and the different townships had a team. And during that time, instead of Maxwell having two separate teams, they teamed up together and created a team within the logging camp to support Maxville. And so I find that really compelling and interesting. And so I've got, that was, a, so I've got a couple of things about our, our, we've had a couple of gatherings at the Maxville town site where we're teaching and we want to celebrate the, this is the logging demonstrations of how to skid a log using mules. And in Maxville, they had a um, horse, they had approximately 17 horses that this is the kind of ways that they would move the timber. And then we use our logging games um, to promote um, this is how people did their jobs, but they made things into games. And I love the idea of bringing everyone together to put, to make that happen. So just to look at the Maxville site and the programs that we have is, I have to go back again, sorry. Our Maxville site programs is we're in the process 
right now, uh, and, uh, and we're just launching a campaign, so please, please be curious about that, that we're purchasing 240 acres, including 96 acres of the original Maxfield town site. And we've created course curriculum that meet the guidelines for Oregon State's um, ethnic studies programs because they in 2021 were actually set to be taught in our schools around Oregon. And because we, there weren't any examples of that, we have with our board members and, and some who are teachers locally and and, and our partners, we're creating course curriculum, outdoor school opportunities. We've been working in archeology span study with universities and trade schools. We're in the process of creating um, art and creative writing expressions. Um, and our, part of our goal is to build that to music and to have that out to many groups. So we work with our indigenous tribes locally, as well as we absolutely set a platform for other groups of people, but we don't tell the story of people from the Japanese culture. We make an opportunity, a platform to set, but we're working with those groups, different groups of people, so that each perspective is supported by the people from their community. So it's so relevant to the work and, um, and it highlights each group. And our, we're building toward facilitated tours of the site that will have an opportunity to talk about the roots, foods, all those foods that immigrants, African-Americans, Native Americans bring to the table and they get, they get morphed into new meals because we've done our work, we've eaten together regionally, we have recipes that um, reflect all of our work and all of our foods that we grow and live by. And the same thing with our music, that music experience provides the same thing. And lastly, Joseph Interpretive Center, um, we have a, um, an interpretive center that's located in Joseph, um, but we also have this alternate, oops, I did it again, sorry, forgive me. So I said the course curriculum, let's talk about the interpretive center. Um, it's located in the hearts of the arts and cultural district. Um, there we have interpretive displays. We have two kiosks um, for those folks that like to do touch and go through some of the uh, materials and some of the videos that we have online today. Um, we have our gift shop that's there and then we have our annual Woodlands and Watersheds Festival that we partner with the Willowa Resources. Um, and we really are lifting up this stewardship of our Woodlands and Watersheds with our work as well as opening up what Maxfield does for again telling the American narrative with the inclusion of all of us and lastly our alternate programming which we have at the National Oregon Trail Museum in Baker City right now um, it's um, going to be there through May and we've got things that have been canceled because of COVID, but this traveling exhibit is phenomenal. We have often offer 3D items as well as some of the video work with OPB. And um, our goal is to add the new video that you all saw this evening in that. We have online webinars is like to this evening, online workshops and um, we're building our gala and our online curriculum in good ways because we truly believe that it's super, it's very important to make connections across every um, avenue and every way to not only tell our story but to welcome others as we grow and as we begin to um, just become a key space to tell the American narrative. It's a healing opportunity for 
the history. It's a safe place to ask questions, which will um, you'll have an opportunity in just a few minutes to do. And so we really want to encourage um, folks to be involved in our programming, in our campaign, and um, in um, the work that we're doing through our universities. And a lot of our universities, we're working with the University of um, Oregon State University and talking with many of their professors about ongoing programming as well as Portland State University and um, Oregon's um, the University of Oregon and Eugene. And so we, we, we've got not just interest, but a collective opportunity to raise awareness and to celebrate the um, cont contributions that all of us have made to our state and and hopefully to promote not just education but healing from some of the um, systemic um, set of um, ideals that it should be about all of us and that we truly believe that with our hearts. So I'm going to go, I believe, to the last um, piece that this is our website, maxvilleheritage.org. Whoops, I went all the way to the front to the back. Isn't that weird how that happens? So I'm going to leave that up a little bit longer. And we're at maxvilleheritage.org. We don't have all the information that we're working on right now on the site we're doing a block point update so that's going to take a little bit longer but if you'll go to our if you're open to going to facebook or instagram um and or twitter we have it's called maxville heritage excuse me maxville heritage interpretive center on our facebook and you'll see um lots of our imagery around the work that we're doing today. So I'm just feeling so excited to be a part of this work that you're that we're putting together that um, this helps me to understand a lot more about how my family interacted with my community in rural Oregon. And truly, I was raised in a space that we were taught how to <clears throat> how to <laughs> process wild game, um, birds of every type, wild birds uh, as um, fish. My dad, uh, I recall that him telling that before I was born, actually it was the year I was born that he went to Celilo Falls and the years before that. And he had a relationship with our tribes then. And so he incorporated that respect and that love for the first peoples that came before our, our families were here. And he and his brothers and the rest of our family members, because ultimately um, Maxville housed um, um, cousins and aunts and uncles and different um, branches of our family. There were many branches of my family that lived at Maxville and ultimately later they went to places like um, Portland during um, the shipbuilding. They went to La Grande and lived out their lives. My dad moved to Baker City, bought a logging truck and did some hauling and there um, some of the people from Maxville went to Grass Valley. They also worked in multiple places, um, including McNary, Arizona. We, California, which was the largest timber company in the United States um, at, at, at the heyday of that timber work. And so there were many places that a lot of these men and women went to and they contributed to those communities and then they found their places. A lot, a lot of the people that based on our records did not go back south and our records also indicate deeply um, through documentation that our, we had Hawaiian loggers then we're 
digging in to finding out more about those voices as well as Guamanian loggers and of course Native American um, families also stayed in some of these communities. So I've had an opportunity to interview some of the people that stayed in those spaces as well as the Japanese logging communities around Oregon that were just discovering different townships and the different relationships in those communities that had the J Japanese and Chinese loggers in those spaces. So it's a bigger story that tells our collective history that we celebrate today and that is important in really just acknowledging just contribution. And so I'm going to take a moment and pause. Gwendolyn, thank you so much for a wonderful talk and for sharing this history with us. And as a first question, I wanted to ask you, you know, this part of Oregon's history, the, you know, its legacy of laws excluding African Americans and systemic racism has been little known for so long. And I'm just curious if you're finding that changing and kind of what you might suggest to viewers to kind of understand that history a bit more deeply. That's a wonderful question. And I've been talking about that with a lot of my workshop people that come up and we continue to take a look at our past and how it's changed in our present. And I don't know that it's changed so much. It's a different group of people that are being affected by the challenges. And a lot of those people are Latinx people. And for those of, the, of our audience that don't use Latinx or we prefer Hispanic, um, um, it that's a growing part of today's um, forestry workers and people that are out there doing the work. And so they're challenged with, with other issues that are reflective of um, an uneven society around that treatment. And I have no answers for it, but part of it is, is just building awareness and conversations around um, those topics. And I'll, the other part of it is, it's just really um, a lot of the history has moved into um, not being because the towns don't exist anymore. And we're doing our, our best. And I think other groups are also involved in going into those communities and talking to the elders that are still here and really documenting it through um, um, every way we can, primary, um, hybrid documentation, secondary, could be through journals, newspapers. Um, and, and a lot of times it's just what the people there say, but you have to note that everyone experiences their history differently and you need that there's different um, interpretations of phrases. For instance, in, in the logger's daughter, they used a term called the candy car because the black men, that's what they used to haul the black men in. And so the white people said, well, we, they made it, you know, it was a joke and they said, well, we called it the candy car because it was full of chocolate drops. And there was a laughter in that from that person. And, and if you'll listen to an African-American child of that era that remembered, they called it that because when their, the men came home, that the kids and the women, that's when their paychecks, their paychecks were there and their 
their fathers would bring them candy. And so we have to really not accept only one perception of our history. And I have heard tell there's a story from one of my tribal friends and they talked about that they don't begin to do the storytelling, that interpretation of story, because it's a language with verse, until everyone shows up because this person knows this history, then this history. And as you go around the circle, everybody tells a component of it that makes that history complete. And that's what we do as we are working to build in those other perspectives to make the story more complete and more true for all of us and to um, dispel that there's this is the only way you look at our story and it's our story it's all of our story it's an American narrative so it's important to make that shine. Gwendolyn can you share with us more about your experience kind of diving into a history that is so closely linked to your family's experience and you know what is it like to be doing you know, this work that is so, you know, deeply connected to, to your own past and, and to your family. So I, again, I was born and raised in La Grande from birth until high school. I spent the last year out of high school. I moved into one of the homes my grandmother owned and I paid rent there and I got a job at the phone company for that next year. And I just realized that the town had so many issues around people of color that most of us really, that's why black people moved out of rural Oregon is because once they became of age to get jobs, they couldn't get jobs. And I ended up moving to Seattle and living there for 30 years. But what I realized is I really, I, and I use the term drank the Kool-Aid um, about how my environment raised me that I wasn't equal, that I wasn't enough, that I wasn't the same. If you knew me as a child, you wouldn't have thought that because I built a lot of muscle tone around it and really um, put that face on. But I didn't internally believe it. I didn't want to be who I was in that space. And it took me to not only go to the city, but to travel to different countries to do humanitarian aid work and to realize that not just me, but other people that are people of color. And when I say that they could be Hawaiian or whatever that is, but I heard the same voices is like when I grew up, I didn't want to look like me. I wanted to have straight hair. I wanted to have blonde hair. I wanted to be this. I wanted to be that. And even in the dominant culture, I've had people say, I would love to have black hair. I would love to have brown skin. It's like, I would love to give that to you. Are you willing to have all the racism that goes with it? And so it's it's a lot of, of really trying to dig into where the origins of that and having to create some healing through my experiences of being an actor and, and working on um, uh, pieces of history that have to do with the enslavement of African people and um, them being, their culture being stripped from them to be trained to be um, in a cast that was less than and really to overcome a lot of that. And, it, and it's a lifelong process in some ways, mm -hmm. but I have no desire anymore. I'm so grateful to say I couldn't do this work without having to walk away from my environment and to work with other people. And to also note that no matter what country you're in, every country has a group of people that they um, make as the scapegoat for behaviors and what they do. And they're not always black people. Mm -hmm. And knowing that that's part of that 
humanness and of the conqueror, the strongest are going to subjugate a group of people. Um, that's just part of that human nature piece that is, um, I know that it exists in, in the way that it, it shaped our thoughts and our world is coming to an end mm -hmm. because we are creating educational opportunities. And with education comes an option to say, do I stick with knowing that I don't know and still staying with that mm -hmm. or no having new information and stating I can make different decisions about change and about um, my community. And the United States has been a place for yeah, of immigrants, of welcoming all peoples. And that includes those of us that were brought to this country against our will originally and have loved and lived and contributed to our communities and want that acknowledgement and recognition and the education to our next generations because we got kids coming up in our schools that need to know that they're welcome in their own communities to thrive and to contribute, like to contribute to those communities. That's huge for us, is that next generation coming up. We want everyone th to feel like they have a part in that and that their people may have had a part in um, before they came along. Yeah. Well, as one final question this evening, I really appreciated what you said about history being healing. And I know history can be painful as well. So I wondered if you might just share a little bit more about the ways that you see history as a means of healing. So the healing, what I found through every juncture in my life as a human on this planet as it really begins with the touch tone of pain that you're in this place of great pain whether it be um being treated in a way being living in um a, a space that's that's not healthy for your family whatever that looks like or just doing this work of talking with each other and saying, I need more education. I need to understand how I can be a more viable um, community member in all of these different ways, or how can I contribute in a way where I'm coming from? And, and part of it is you, we need to address it where we are right now is I can't, you know, build something up for you. I need to address you where you are and how you come. So it's really about creating safe spaces to do this, this work that we do. And also being willing to be uncomfortable. And note, I've been uncomfortable since I was five years old. Old, when that first little kid my age said, mommy, look, there's an N word. And I looked because it sounded interesting. And, but they were looking at me. And I realized at that point when I couldn't articulate anything that I was set aside from my fellows as a child, as a baby. Right. And that's something that we, can control and manage that we don't set aside our kids our pre-k all of it we don't set them aside from their fellows that we bring them into a fold of this is part of our history to be uncomfortable with learning how to be an ally to other groups of people to be willing to ask questions in a way. And, and again, we're all coming where we're from. And I've had many of interviews where they use the N word very freely, but they didn't use it in a way of that N word did this. It was like, well, we called him N word Bob, or we called him Lightning, or we called him Pinto because he had vitiligo 
we have to get rid of those old ideas that, well, those names came with them people. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. It's that's part of an old heritage that we can choose not to hang on to. That we can choose to rise to the top like cream, all of us, and learn where we are, but continue to learn and have patience and have tolerance. And again, the biggest thing is being willing to be uncomfortable and feel bad because <laughs> I have to build up from the inside out for my joy. And that healing happens because you'd be surprised. We're all related by what, 50 degrees. Totally, we're all related. And we're all in that same pool of wanting to just be honored and live in our space with heart and spirit and joy and safety. We want to be honored for that in our spaces. Every one of us wants that. And I think we have so much more in common. Well, thank you. That is a really beautiful place to end this evening. And Gwendolyn, I just thank you so much for taking time to spend with us this evening, for sharing more about your work, for sharing with us about Maxville. And I also want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities for their support of tonight's event. And thank you all for being here and for joining us. And I hope you have a great rest of your evening. <laughs>